Hey everybody, welcome back to AIT 1002 for yet another installment of alternators. Okay, so far we've talked about feeding our power grid with our alternators from the power plants and how we are feeding at AC voltage. We've talked about sine waves uh, and we've talked about creating the voltage by spinning our rotor inside our uh, stator coils. Okay, and we get an output voltage from our alternator. Okay, and, and we, we kind of uh, made that relevant with the, the big power plants. That do, they do the same thing. Okay, now I want to talk about uh, about how much voltage are we uh, producing, okay, uh, <clears throat> uh, coming out of these alternators and supplying to us, okay? Well, a couple of things impact or affect the amount of voltage that is created. Number one, remember we talked about, we were talking about turning our, uh, our, our magnetic rotor through the, the coils of the stator, okay? Well, one of the things that affects the magnetic field uh, in the armature of the rotor okay is the number of turns of, co of uh, wire in the coil okay if you remember from uh, our example here's the the coil and the actual alternator that you'll be working with at some point uh, the number of turns how many times we wrap that uh, uh, wire around the pole pieces okay that impacts how, how strong the magnetic field is. The more turns we have of the wire, the stronger the magnetic field. Also, the, it determines the, the diameter of that wire. The thicker the, the wire, the, more, the greater the diameter of the wire, the, uh, the more magnetic field, the stronger the magnetic field. And also, the voltage that's actually being uh, put into the coil, uh, if it impacts the strength of the magnetic field as well. Going back to our previous uh, lesson there, or lecture, I should say, uh, remember, we vary the voltage. If we vary the voltage coming in from our external source into our slip rings and then into our coil, the more voltage we put in there, the stronger the magnetic field in the rotor. The stronger the magnetic field in the rotor, the more voltage is induced in the stator coils, which gives us a higher voltage coming out of the alternator. Okay? So those things impact how much voltage our, we are actually creating. Okay? And also the speed at which we are spinning this. This is critical in power in the power industry. Uh, they have to be locked down extremely tight. R the RPM has to be like spot on, right on the button. Uh, you can't have variations in this at all because that affects, that impacts what's being fed out on the grid and you can't have that. So they are uh, a lot of computer control that really dials it in um, to make sure that the RPM, that rotor is spinning precisely at what it's supposed to be spinning at. Okay, so again, we spin that rotor inside the coil and it creates our voltage and we get this sine wave, okay? Now there's a couple of t different types of voltage and I'm not talking about AC or DC. I'm talking about the different, we're now in AC. We're going to be strictly in AC right here uh, for the most part of this class, okay? We are going to touch on DC in the next lesson, but for right now, the, this is going to be all AC. So the amount of voltage <clears throat> that is measured from our peak, remember the sine wave here, we're peaking, this is where our road, this is where our rotor is in perfect alignment with our set of coils, okay? That's peaking right there. The, the, uh, we call this peak voltage. That's the amount of voltage uh, when we ref reference it to our zero or uh, our zero uh, plane right here, our zero point, okay? So this is the amount of voltage measured from the reference line in one direction. In this case, this is the positive direction. Peak voltage can also be the amount of voltage uh, measured from the reference line in the opposite direction or the negative voltage. Either one of these is a peak voltage, okay? So the peak voltage can be positive or it can be negative. And we write peak voltage as P sub plus V or the negative is P sub negative V, okay? So those are our, uh, that's how we, that's how we uh, notate that, all right? We also have peak-to-peak -peak voltage. Now, these are the voltages that don't reference the zero line. They reference the peaks themselves, the distance uh, between the two peaks of the power. In this particular case, we're, we've got 10 volts positive and 10 volts negative as peaks, okay? And <clears throat> we, set, we notate this as V sub PP, okay? Yeah, I said PP, okay? Let's go ahead and get that over with. All right, so we've got V sub PP uh, equals... Uh, v uh, of the positive uh, P plus V sub negative P, or the absolute value of V sub negative P. Now, when you see a number, when you see these vertical lines like this, that uh, indicates that you're looking at the absolute value of that number. Going back for some math, maybe some of you haven't had math in a while. Okay, so anytime you see the absolute value signs like this, okay, and say a negative number, we'll just take the negative number three you've got it inside those vertical lines, you're looking at the absolute value of negative three. 
That's the number of spaces from zero that that number is. Number uh, negative three is three spaces from zero. It doesn't matter if it's positive or negative, they're still three, three spaces away from the zero, okay? So absolute value is three spaces away from zero, and negative three is still three. So the absolute value of negative three is positive three. All right, in our example here, we've got 10 volts plus the absolute value of negative 10, okay, negative 10, which is positive 10. So our peak-to-peak -peak voltage is 20 volts, okay? So that's our peak voltage and our peak-to-peak -peak voltage. That is not measured when we take our meter, okay? That's not measured when we take our meter and stick it in our wall outlet, all right? Okay, that is a different type of value, okay? So if I ask you, uh, if our household value or our household voltage coming into our breaker panel being fed from the utility company is 240 volts, right? Nope, wrong, it's not. What we're measuring with our meter is root mean square voltage or effective voltage. Same thing, root mean square voltage or effective voltage, okay? And even with our little meter here, I'm not sure you're going to be able to see this, our fluke meter, uh, we, it says uh, right here, true RMS meter, okay? That means that it's measuring true RMS, not peak to peak or not peak voltage, okay? So, uh, our true, our true R, um, excuse me, our uh, RMS and our effective voltages are very different from the peak to peak and our peak voltage, okay? Now, when I'm talking about root mean square, uh, what are we exactly talking about? This was developed uh, so that we could compare the heat values of an a AC to DC circuit, okay? I'm gonna use this as an example. The R RMS gives us the amount of voltage that uh, needs to be applied to his DC circuit uh, to create the same heat value uh, in, an AC, in the same AC circuit, okay? This next image, we'll break it down a little bit further. Okay, you remember from AIT 1001 or any basic electricity class that you've had, we got a resistor that steps down voltage for us, okay? And the, its job is to step it down. Anytime it has to do work, though, it's going to create heat. Resistors create heat. If I ask you to go out and do some work on a 90 degree day, you go dig a ditch, you're going to work and you're going to generate heat. The heat is the byproduct of the work, all right? So we're generating a certain amount of heat from this resistor. We got a 10 volt AC uh, power supply, a 10 volt DC power supply, okay? And we got a resistor, same identical values. Everything's the same except for the type of voltage it is, AC versus DC, okay? So the heat values are going to be very different. Why is that? Because if you remember, the, uh, we're creating zero voltage right here, and we're incrementally stepping up the voltage till we peak. And it's sort of like doing the law of averages, okay? The averages are not going to give you a peak voltage, okay? they're going to give you an average voltage, okay? You can kind of look at it that way, as opposed to, it's going to be less, as opposed to a DC voltage, which never goes through the zero plane and has to be averaged in. These lower values don't have to be averaged in. It's a straight, solid DC signal, straight, solid voltage, never passing through the zero plane, never being weakened here, and then building, and then weakening again, okay? It's solid. So. When we look at our um, two circuits, this one has to, to take in the, the, the buildup and the, and the draw, drawback uh, or, or coming down off that, that peak uh, when it's um, putting voltage into the circuit. So the heat value coming out of the resistor is naturally going to be less than an identical 10 volts of DC because it's never changing. It's going straight all the time. Okay. Now, in order to, to determine how much uh, voltage we need to put in this DC circuit so that the heat coming out of here is going to equal this. We're, we're going to do a little bit of math to, to figure that out. Now, if right now, like I said, as they stand, 10 volts AC and 10 volts DC, DC is going to put a lot more heat out. So we'll need to figure out how much we need to reduce the voltage on the DC side to match the heat value of that coming out of the AC side. All right. So I'm going to show you how to do that. All right. So if we're looking for the DC voltage, what we should be putting into that circuit, okay, so that the two heat values match, okay, we're going to take the root mean square of our AC voltage, okay, and we're going to multiply that times 1 over the square root of 2. Now, I'm giving you some help here. Also, this is the nice thing about uh, video lectures. You can stop at any point and see these formulas and work through them, okay? So these should be in your notes by all means, okay? You're going to see these again. 
So we're going to take the root mean square of our uh, volts AC, multiply it over by 1 over the square root of 2, which happens to be 0.707. I'm giving you that. So we're going to multiply it by 0.707. So to find the, the DC volts, we're going to multiply the 10 times 0.707. And that gives us a value of the DC value of 7.07 .07 that we need to apply here so that we get the same amount of heat from here as we do from here. Okay. So if you need to back this up a little bit, by all means do so, okay? So that's how we figured the, uh, the uh, root mean square value for the DC circuit, okay? Now, let's take a look and let's put this in a practical application, all right? So we got our power coming from the power company. They feed us two uh, legs of 120 and they, they feed it in here and we put our meter across here, our, our fluke meter, and we measure 240 volts. That's 240 volts on our meter. And remember, our meter is root mean square, okay? So that's the value it gives us. So we take that value of root mean square of our um, AC uh, reading and we multiply that by the square root of two. Well, I just happened to give you that as well. So square root of two is equal to 1.414, all right? So we take that value, 240 volts coming in here off our meter, and we multiply that times 1.414. Guess what? We actually have a peak value of 339 volts AC. That's really what's coming into the house. What we're measuring with our meter, though, is root mean square, all right? <clears throat> Same thing with our outlet. If we take one leg of that, out, of that 240 and we bring it over to one of our outlets, when we stick our, our voltmeter into the outlet, uh, we should measure 120 volts, root mean square. But what's our peak voltage? Okay, we're going to do the formula again. Take our root mean square of the volts AC that we know, which is coming off of our meter, which is 120. We multiply that by the square root of 2, 1.414, and our peak voltage coming out of our outlet is actually 169 volts AC. Okay? Now, what about our peak to peak? Let's use our formula there, all right? Remember, we said our peak to peak is our voltage of the positive peak uh, plus the absolute value of our voltage on the negative peak, okay? And we determined that uh, about two slides ago, okay? We said that was 339 volts uh, <coughs> of peak voltage. So we take the 339, add it to the absolute value of the negative 339 volts. That's the negative swing of that sine wave. And we add these two together. And our peak to peak voltage is actually going to be uh, 678 volts, okay, coming in right there, all right? So, uh, our peak-to-peak -peak voltage on our outlet, okay, remember we said that uh, our peak voltage is 169, uh, our peak-to-peak -peak is, is uh, our voltage on the positive plus the absolute value, absolute value of uh, the negative peak. We add those two together, and the, remember that the absolute value of this negative 169 is 169. Add those two together, and the peak voltage coming out of our outlet is 338 volts. Okay? I want you to stop this at some point uh, and practice this, or come back to this and look at these formulas. Make sure you're taking these notes and practice these, okay? And make sure you understand them, okay? Because you will see them again. All right? So, again, our meters that we use, our, our multimeters that we use, they actually measure the peak-to-peak, uh, -peak, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, the true RMS uh, uh, reading. It does not measure peak-to-peak -peak or peak. Uh, one of the reasons that we would do that, we would use an oscilloscope. That'll also, we often do that to measure the quality of the power coming into a facility. If we've got some problems, particularly with electronics that are sensitive and things like that, to uh, spikes or, or maybe the, there's a power imbalance or something like that uh, in one of our phases, we look at our oscilloscope and we measure peak to peak and peak to uh, and, and our peak voltage as well. It gives us an idea of the condition of the power coming into our facilities. All right, but that's why we do that. But for overall purposes, we use our multimeter that measures true RMS, and the true RMS is is, is the value that's obtained from the peak voltages. Okay. All right. I'm going to stop it here. We've got one more installment, but again, small chunks, a lot of math to take in there. So. Uh, watch this, make sure you've got the formulas down, and uh, we'll continue this uh, into the final uh, segment of alternators, okay? Thanks for watching. Again, if you're having any trouble or struggling with me, uh, struggling with this, come see me, uh, email me, give me a call, find me in the lab, and we'll make sure to work uh, out with each other, okay? All right, other than that, thanks a lot for watching, and we'll talk to you soon.